Now, ladies and gentlemen, when I read that Dr. Patrick Dixon would be one of today's guests, several questions immediately popped up in my head. How do you actually become a futurologist? How do you study the future? When you do your research, how do you get your material? And how do you pay a futurologist? When will I get my money? With other words, how predictable is the future? Now let us welcome Europe's leading futurologist. Wall Street called him a global change guru. I wonder if he saw that coming too. Now anyway, today we are honored to welcome him as the keynote speaker for the Visit 2005 conference. Here he is, and there he comes, Dr. Patrick Dixon. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, and uh, welcome to you. I hope you've enjoyed the exhibition as much as I have, uh, whether it's uh, looking at uh, a machine, which is one of the most powerful PCs in the world, but still takes three whole days to perform a single one of these mammoth calculations. 40% faster than any other machine on the face of the Earth today, just about. But still, it shows us that we are on the edge of incredibly powerful IT demands for the future. And one of the challenges is this, that either we take hold of the future and apply these technologies to shape tomorrow, or we find that tomorrow starts to shape us. And that's really what this conference is about. It's about being smart. It's about innovation. It's about creativity. And I want to spell the future to you, F-U-T-U-R-E. And there are fascinating things in this exhibition. For example, did you realize, if you're involved in financial services, did you realize that every one of your liquid crystal uh, displays in your bank is radiating everything that is on its screen? And anyone with the right technology can read what is on every screen in your bank from 100 meters away. Put your hands up if you knew that. Well, perhaps you need to get round the corner to the piece of technology which stops you from reading it. My friends, we are on the edge of a next generation shift in technology. We are installing systems which are so leaky, we have no idea what we're doing. As you've just shown me, most of you had no idea that every one of your trade secrets, your future patent applications, the latest bits of your research, your technology, your most secret thoughts are being broadcast up to 100 meters away on every one of your screens. So it's just an example of the future, a future which is going so fast that most boards and senior teams are struggling to catch up. A future. A future, my friends, where it takes maybe up to 20 whole years just to extract all the software potential inside today's desktop PC. Because that's the struggle for us, is to design systems which really exploit the technology that we already have and to build systems which will go on being flexible, adaptable, shapeable, moldable as strategy changes almost overnight because our world can change almost overnight. Now, you know, we can, get, we can get swept away with technology and all the excitement of the gadgets and the gizmos and all the other bits and bytes and forget something quite profound, which is the future is actually not about technology. The success or failure of just about every system you design is something to do with emotion and how future people will accept the things which you're creating. Whether they engage with them, whether they actually get it, and whether your customers are actually willing to use these tools. That's why we don't believe market research. You know, my friends, don't believe market research. Market research can't tell you the future. Market research only tells you what your customers think about the future, and that's very different. And you can find hundreds of examples. Let's take my own mother. My mother used to hate mobile phones and didn't like email. If you had asked her if she would ever buy or sell shares online, she would have told you to go and get a life. Okay? And yet, one day, she phoned me up and she said, 
I need to go online now, today, this afternoon. The reason was she found that all of her friends were inviting each other to parties, cinemas, theatres, anything you like, on email. And then they would write her a note and put it in the post. And of course, she missed all her social life. So she said, I have to go online. And I took her that day to uh, PC World. And we looked at all the computers. I started with the very cheapest. She said, no, 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 no. She said, I want the best. So you go up, 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 up. And eventually she comes out with one of the uh, really powerful machine with, you know, state of the art, Windows XP professional, uh, video conference enabled. Uh, then uh, she says, I think I need Skype or something like that. Or I, I think I need a, a, a wireless something. I, I need a wireless broadband network in my house. And she says, oh, and what about these mobile phones? What is the best? And you know what? My mother jumped 35 years of technology in three and a half hours and left all her bankers behind. So, by all means, listen to my mother, listen to her carefully, but don't believe what she says. And that's what we need to do when it comes to building the future. We listen to our clients, we get closer to them than they are to themselves, and then we build a scenario, a vision, that's what this conference is about, a vision of where your customers, your internal customers, or your external customers, it's the same, where they are likely to be living in the future, and we imagine how they will create new demands on us. That means that you start building options, facilities, modules, potential inside your own systems right now today that your board don't even know that they will need. We hide these things in there. And they're there because one day the board will change their mind and it will take two years to develop it. So I want to show you a video which passed the market research test. It scored 10 out of 10 in Britain for market research. But when, we sh when it was shown on TV, the video was banned. The question is, why? <laughs> What is wrong with the British sense of humor? I, I, I mean, what is wrong with the people in my country? Why is it that we couldn't get the joke? What do you think? Why, why was it banned in my country? Any idea? Hmm? Any ideas why this video might be banned? Yeah, I know it's a little close to the truth. It tells us something about life. Put your hands in the air if you know that Christmas comes round more quickly every year. No, <laughs> actually the world is speeding up. It's very strange. Now it tells us something about human beings, which as I say, is that we are emotional creatures. And uh, you know, that's why SMS is so important. Uh, my son is here. I hope he doesn't mind me picking him out. He's 16 years old. Uh, he will tell you that voice calls are so last century. You know, who does voice calls now, Dad? Why? It's not just economic. There's something about SMS which has an emotional power to it. It's the same with my daughter and chat. Uh, who here uses chat screens in your personal life? Put your hands up. Have a look around. Well, it's about 5%. But if you ask Paul's generation, it will be 150%. My daughter here has up to 12 chat screens going at the same time. And she goes a little bit like this. 
That will take him another five minutes. And she chats another one, chats to another one, connects Tom, Jerry, and Sarah together to have a little conversation. And so she goes on. S the SMS chat have huge emotional power. They have a power which is beyond the telephone call for a teenager. Why? Because a teenager can run out of words on the phone. You have Thomas talking to my daughter. How are you? Chat. Fine. Good. She's chatting away to other people. He comes back five minutes later. He says, actually, not so fine. Sorry to hear that. There is no reply for 10 minutes. Maybe he's gone away. Maybe he is doing his homework. Then comes another. Actually, it was a bad day today. Sorry to hear. Eventually, maybe over two or three hours, this boy will tell my daughter that his mother left home last night. She's left home before, but this time she left a note and she is not coming back. And it took him three hours gradually to tell her a little bit and another bit to say it. And if it had been a phone conversation, it would have gone like this. Hi Tom, how are you? Fine. Good day today, yeah. You fancy going out tonight for pizza? Nah. What's the problem? Too much work. Okay. See ya. See ya. See ya. Take care. Bye. 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 Gone. There. There. Zero communication. With chat, he knew that Elizabeth was hanging on every word, but he was not wasting her time. And gradually it comes out, and something very powerful begins to happen. And that is why people are get falling in love using chat. They are getting married as a result of uh, the online channel. They are forming long-term relationships. Chat is important. It's just part of this emotional thing. Searching for love, whatever it is, the power of the written word is very great. Now, we can look at attackers and defenders in every area of your business, but one big one is Skype. I mean, this is just an incredible story. And you know, there isn't, I don't think any telecom company knows really how to respond to this threat. They don't know whether to embrace it and allow voice over the internet or to ban it. And the uh, telecom companies are being stretched in both directions at the moment. But just look at these incredible figures here. Uh, you know, unique users, 12 and a half million per week, and they're getting free voice calls anywhere in the world. You can select two, three or four or five people, put them in a conference call. Soon they'll be offering video as well. In fact, I think it's more or less there. It costs virtually nothing. I can phone uh, Nigeria or Russia for the cost of a local call just with an exit onto an ordinary phone line. It's, it's actually working and the quality is better than I've ever, for, ever known even on a digital mobile phone. It raises questions about the future of banking, uh, this next generation. eBay has taught us a lot. What happens when you can put a price on just about anything on an eBay type channel? But you know, we need to go beyond the email generation. We need to go beyond the personal PDAs that are in your pockets and get ready for the next jump in client demand. And one thing is certain, those that you are servicing and supporting in your huge organizations, many of you, are going to want far more involvement in their own personal technology decisions. They'll want support to do it their way, in their time, probably in their home, or in their home office, certainly on the move. And uh, they're going to want access to all the things which they can put on their own personal PC at home, on their own personal PC at work. I'll give you an example, which is Google Search. Who here has downloaded the Google desktop onto your own PC? Put your hands up and have a look around. You know, Google Desktop is putting the power of the whole of the Google Search machine, obviously, onto every machine. And in three seconds, I can search every email I've ever sent, every file, every word processing document, every Word, every Excel. It saves me about two hours every single week. But the fact is, 
that only 10 or 15% of you are actually using it. It's completely free. It can increase your productivity dramatically and should, in my view, be rolled out right across entire organizations. But often we have a CIO policy which makes it almost impossible for people to innovate using low-cost, no-brainer solutions uh, which could be implemented tomorrow without any support. Fast urban. Well, I hope you've all enjoyed the digital home and the wireless video streaming and all the rest. The point of the digital home is this. It's multitasking. The days are over when people just sit in front of a TV. They'll be sitting in front of a TV. And maybe they're watching a movie on the wall as well using a data projector and they're SMSing and they're doing a stack of other things as well using digital channels, all in the same environment. Um, and that's what the future is all about. But my friends, if we're talking about using wireless bandwidth, then there is only one application which can do it, and that is video. And the reason is simple. If you have two gigabytes in your pocket of wireless bandwidth, and I've had that in my home environment for almost a decade, and I have in my pocket now 0.3, um, about 250k per second, permanently on. But the only way you can use 2, 4, 8, or 16 megabits per second, sorry, megabits per second of bandwidth, of course, is to use a video. Because a high quality video call for two hours is equivalent to around 125 million emails and attachments. So that's the point. For the phone company, they have to promote video. And that's why you're seeing video cameras on every phone, picture cameras on every phone. Oh, hi, Sam. Oh. And the cost will oh. fall towards oh, yeah. zero. There you are. <coughs> oh, okay. How was school today? At yeah. the moment, yeah, really we still have an emotional oh, yeah. resistance to using video, but that will change. As I say, the future is not about technology, the future is about emotion. Now, on a, on a video call, of course, there are two views on most phones. One looks out towards you and one towards me. Now, if I'm phoning, uh, say, my wife, my wife knows what I look like. What she's interested in is where I am. So, in fact, it's the camera looking out that is often the most important from the social point of view. Talking of women, Women will drive the next generation of IT. Why? Well, 95% of you here are men, uh, which is typical of the IT industry at the moment. But 70% of retail customers are women. 70% of all retail purchases are women. 70% of all online banking transactions are carried out by women. By the way, it's the men who open the accounts, but there's no follow through. It's the women who actually spend the money. You look at Amazon purchases, holiday purchases, life insurance policy purchases, pensions decisions. These are driven mainly by women. But 70%, 95% perhaps, of all IT is designed by men. Now watch out for the women. 75% of all US and UK wealth is actually owned by those over the age of 65. In fact, Two-thirds of all those that have ever reached the age of retirement, whatever that is now, but two-thirds of all those in the whole world who have ever reached the age of 65 are alive today. And two-thirds of them are women. Why? Because, well, I hate to say it, you guys, but the testosterone, uh, the male hormones that we have, uh, are um, bad news. <laughs> Uh, women live longer than us. And uh, so that is why women own most of the wealth of America and most of the wealth of Britain. Now, the aging population is going to have a very profound effect on all of you here in terms of your recruitment, the teams that you have, and the processes that you run, the products that you sell, the services you provide. On current trends, Germany, this country here today, this country, Germany, will shrink from around 82 million to around 10 to 15 million people in four generations. Why is that? When you have a country, by the way, the same is happening to my country, to Italy, France, Germany, Sweden. Do you know in some parts of, uh, of the capital of Sweden, the average age 
for a woman to have her first child is now 38 years old. Now, when you have this kind of thing, what it means is she's not going to have another one. There will be one child in that household, and if that pattern carries on over two or three generations, you halve the population in every generation unless you balance it with immigration. So that's why I put here, in many countries in Europe, on current trends, unless something changes and people discover how to make babies again, we will see f up to four couples produce only a single great-grandchild. Now that has, as I say, vast implications for every aspect of what you are doing today. And the most important, perhaps, is this, that every technology that you design needs to be designed with older people in mind. <coughs> I wonder if I could have a drink of water, actually. Would that be okay? Fast urban tribal. Tribalism is... There's one here, is there? Thanks very much. Tribalism is the most powerful force in the world today. It's more powerful than atomic bombs, than the military might of the Russians, the Chinese, Japanese, and Americans. Tribalism explains what happens when one group says we are us and you are them. Tribal leadership is what happens when we start to harness that power. So uh, Fujitsu Siemens, for instance, is a tribe. In fact, is a tribe of two great tribes welded together. Um, and the success of every merger depends on understanding these tribal cultures and making them work. Watch out for tribes. Tribes are the biggest driver inside every corporation. Every successful product and brand creates a tribe. And every successful company nurtures and feeds those tribes. It's getting quite difficult to target them, especially now that every tribal group is being subjected to around $1 billion a month of advertising. And one of the things we need to do is to use technology to stay close to tribes. And every customer is part of your tribe. Now, let me ask a question here. Put your hands up if you find robots on telephones irritating. You know when you phone up and they say, press one for accounts, press two for customer service, press three. Put your hands up if you find it irritating. Put your hands up if sometimes it makes you really angry. <laughs> okay. All right. Very good. Now, I want you to close your eyes and answer another question really honestly. Put your hands up if your own company has such a system. Okay, all right, now. <laughs> okay, that's the problem, you see. We are using technology which we know uh, puts people off. We know wastes their time. We know makes them really angry. We know uh, put, uh, 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 it gets in the way when they have a problem. They're coming to us. They need help, but we put a robot on. I would argue to you that the best place to use human beings is in that first phone call. That we want a human being to answer the phone and the image of your corporation will be created by their experience of how that call is first handled. And you might say, yeah, but it costs a lot of money. No, it doesn't. Especially if you can outsource it to a country where labor is a lot cheaper. I would say that this is the best investment we can possibly make to switch calls into uh, situations where people know who you are, they know what you want, they know exactly how to help you, and they just sound friendly and great people. Fast, urban, tribal, universal. Universal, of course, is about globalization, virtual companies, and outsourcing. And I know that many of you here today are deeply concerned about the impact of outsourcing on your payroll here in Europe. Let me say this that it's going to continue. One of the reasons, actually, is not about cost. It's intellectual capital. If we look back at the uh, Millennium 2000 problem, you know, of course, the reason why India won 20% of the entire global spend on that issue was because of intellectual capital, nothing else. Well, it was cost as well, but the fact is they had more COBOL programmers than anyone else. If we pass the videotape forward now to this year, in 2005, this year, in my country of 60 million people, this year, we will produce 8,600 new 
IT graduates, 8,600. But this year, India will produce 840,000 IT graduates. And every one of them is as well qualified as our 8,600. So that is a huge challenge. And you might say, well, Patrick, what hope is there for the IT industry in Europe? Listen, where we add value is this. We add value when we get close to people who have a real problem. We eyeball them, eyeball to eyeball, over dinner, lunch, in their offices. We talk with their teams. It could be inside your organization. It could be an external client. We're getting right inside the very heart of what they need and in partnership together, working those things out, that will never be outsourced. Systems, critical design, which requires total integration at the most senior level into every part of corporate strategy, will not be outsourced. The things, of course, that will be outsourced are the commoditizable elements of it, the teams of people to implement it. Yes, of course. So we, those of us in this room, need to be concentrating on really adding value where it absolutely counts. Now, of course, to make these relationships work requires us to be using some of the exciting new collaboration tools like the ones you find outside this room. And I hope you have a chance to look at them because they are really interesting and could save a huge amount of time. The real test of collaborative tools is this. Does it cut down the number of flights that you have to do between here and India each year? Does it save the number of flights between Frankfurt and Zurich each year? If it does, the tool is working. If not, it's probably almost a waste of time. So our aim is not to stop meetings. Our aim is to enrich the meetings to make sure that every one of those times when we get together really counts. I just want to say something about always on video. The days of uh, sitting in a video conference suite are over. It's history. It's gone. Who has broadband at home? Put your hands up if you have broadband in your house. You have more bandwidth, sir, in your home than you do on your desk at work, right? And you are able, at a flick of one switch, to run a 24-hour video conference, 24 hours, 365 days a week, from your home in Frankfurt to his in Zurich, to yours in Hong Kong, and to yours in, in London. It costs us nothing because the bandwidth at the moment is free. We just leave the computer running. And if you want a nice big screen, run it on a data projector like I have in my house onto a nice big wall. And that means that we can sit in front of each other and we can share the same space. And if no one's in the office, we still leave it running. Why? Because it's one office, right? If it's one office, one virtual space, then a one wall here, starting from the floor level right up to the ceiling, I see New York. I see the whole of the New York team over here. On this side, I see the whole of the Singapore team. Behind me, on this screen here, is the, the uh, Zurich team. This is the Frankfurt team. And we have 30 people in my office as well. And this can run 365 days a year for the cost of the electric current to drive the light bulb in the projector. It's zero cost to run these things because the bandwidth really effectively has fallen towards zero. And yet we're still not really using these tools right. Um, and we, we plug the thing in, we don't like the video, we feel self-conscious, we wonder if the camera is looking at us too closely, we're wondering about our tie, our hair, the color of the suit, we turn it off. We say we would prefer to use telephone. And then what happens is, after a month of telephone calls, we say, we better meet. I suggest to you, my friends, that if you get these virtual offices right, that you will find you're in constant meeting. You are living, breathing, sleeping in a way, in a community of people who are solving problems together. And what will happen is you'll be saying, George, I didn't know you were in today. Hey, Jerry, 
um, time for a cup of coffee. Cup of coffee, turn up the volume, phone him. Attract, he's not looking at you. Phone him. Yes, it's me. Hello. Cup of coffee. Coffee. Mary's just come in from Singapore. That's fantastic. And by the end of the hour, you've solved the problem and you don't need to fly. So um, this is not new. It's uh, been around for a long time. Uh, this is a video that happened when my, my wife and I were in uh, Tokyo together. And we dialed home. And I usually sit in my virtual chair, looking at my physical chair, looking at the screen. And I appeared on my screen, looking at my physical chair, and there one of our children was. We ran the call for 36 hours. Why? Because, well, it didn't cost anything. So, and uh, this is another example of it. This is a lecture to the World Bank. Uh, operating in nine different countries um, and running um, in real time, well, you could run it forever, it doesn't matter. Meetings will always matter, but let's make them count, that's all I'm saying. Now, can I just move a little bit to manufacturing, wholesale, retail, distribution, logistics? We're talking about a new revolution here, which will replace human beings completely. Perhaps it's the biggest digital step that we've seen since the advent of the internet, um, and its drive since 1995. I'm, of course, talking about RFID technology, radio frequency identification devices. Gillette has used 500 million of them in the last 12 months alone. It's true that you get a reaction to them if you use them in the retail sector, as Bariton did when they found that they put the RFID tag in trousers and there was a consumer boycott in the United States. But this technology is going to transform every aspect of the logistics process. How big could it be? Well, Walmart has said to every supplier that this year they have to supply every box into every warehouse with tags. In fact, not quite true. It's the top 100 suppliers. But by the next 18 months, all the others have to do the same. When they do, Walmart will be using 10 billion of these devices. We're talking about a computer system the size of a grain of sand, as you know, with software, hardware, microprocessor, operating system, permanent memory. You read and write to it. It is stable in the environment for 100 years, a price of around three and a half cents, and powered by the electricity in the air inside this room. If this is an extraordinary new stage in the digital world, and hardly anyone has yet fully woken up to it. Now what happens, of course, if we put it into the individual products, is we then start to change the whole of retailing. And that's already happened here in Germany with Metro. And the idea is you just walk into Metro, grab what you want, and you just walk out. And uh, Metro knows who you are. They saw me coming in through the door. They uh, know what I've got, and they know exactly where to charge it. And if you know who I am, what I've got, and where to charge it, then we're on the basis of a whole new way of retailing, a new, new way of managing uh, the flow of value, a new way of financial services uh, and back-end processing. Because, of course, as I run out of the store, I get an SMS into my phone, and it says, Dr. Dixon, thank you for shopping at Walmart. We have just deducted your American Express $32. But it won't be American Express. It'll